Hi, I'm Tyler Falls. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today we're going to be looking at another one of Kyle Hill's videos called Why Isn't Hiroshima a Nuclear Wasteland? Well, the nuclear attack happened decades ago, and they've had plenty of time to recover, and the majority of the dose was blown out, so... That's it in a nutshell. But let's see what he has to say. Unlike other cities that have had brushes with nuclear disasters like Pripyat in Ukraine and Fukushima here in Japan, Hiroshima is not abandoned. Far from it. As you can see, the city is flourishing. One thing I want to clear about about Fukushima, the entire city isn't abandoned. Pripyat is in Ukraine. But Fukushima, there is a, an exclusion zone, a much smaller exclusion zone around the nuclear power station, but it was nowhere on the same level as Chernobyl. Why? The answer has as much to do with history as it does physics. This is the true story of how Hiroshima survived the atomic bomb. To avoid a ground invasion of Japan, something the Japanese people had already proven would be a tooth and nail battle for every square inch of island. Then President Harry S. Truman made the impossible decision to- A lot of you guys in the history, both the history of Japan and the history of the world, I guess, had a lot of comments about how many more lives would have been lost if we actually had to fight a naval invasion, ground war, D-Day meets Stalingrad type battle in to actually invade and take Japan. I did a bit of looking up and I found like plans from Operation Olympic and Operation Coronet, which would have been an insane operation that would have made D-Day look like nothing. Thanks for uh, cluing me in on that. I, I really appreciate those comments. US scientists had decided that Hiroshima, Japan was a city suitable for the shock to leadership that was needed to finally knock an already reeling Japan out of the war. The city was an army depot at the time, surrounded by hills that would provide a focusing effect for what was the most funded and secretive government project in U.S. history. Look at the size of that list. I guess if we had, if Japan didn't surrender, and again, I appreciate the comments that we actually had a third one ready. I was, I was incorrect in my comment on another video about us having to wait a while. We would have had to wait a while after using number three, because uh, number three would have been ready in August of 1945. But yeah, there, were these, there was this potential to escalate it further by either using more nuclear weapons or using more um, firebombing type air raids, like the same ones that devastated Tokyo. I like how he includes these uh, declassified documents in this video. That's a really nice touch. The strike was ordered. The bombs that would be dropped, special. I got chills when he said that, special. Any of you else get chills? Wow, I've never seen that before. 44.4 seconds after release, the bomber's cabin filled with a blinding white light. A fireball with the same surface temperature as the sun had expanded to wider than the Eiffel Tower is that's about 5,000 degrees Celsius. Interestingly enough, the corona of the sun is actually a lot hotter than that. Short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. Destroyed its usefulness. I want to think about that one. Such an odd phrasing, and yet such an accurate phrasing. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. Perhaps President Truman was misinformed on that one. The one on Nagasaki w did, but Hiroshima, no. Only, only 16,000. Hard numbers on the number of people that died as the result of the Hiroshima bombing have been revised and revised again for decades. It's hard to get accurate body counts when thousands of bodies were literally turned into vapor. But it's generally estimated that in less time than it took the Enola Gay to fly to Japan and back, some 70 to 80,000 people had died, 30% of Hiroshima's population. 70% of the buildings were rubble or char or both. One thing to keep in mind is cities back then weren't as like modern cities are in that they were a lot more susceptible to 
fire damage. The the structures were just a lot weaker, less of the less of the reinforced material was invested in a lot of the city's infrastructure. That's one of the reasons why the fire bombings on Tokyo were so much more effective. A lot of a lot of wooden structures, easily collapsible sort of material. So it was a particularly vulnerable target to any type of bombing, bombing, especially a nuclear weapon. 70,000 injured succumbed to bodily damage exacerbated by acute radiation syndrome. Unsurprisingly, the few doctors that were left, 80% had died in the blast, had no... And this is what he can probably get away with showing us on YouTube. <laughs> the real injuries, um, look them up if you dare. Viewer discretion, discretion greatly advised but it's one of the most horrific ways to go, combining burning and radiation poisoning. No idea what acute radiation syndrome was. It had never happened before, and therefore they could not effectively treat it. This crisis was compounded by the fact that the average radiation dose that would kill approximately 50% of adults. Even if you could treat it, the entire area is mostly destroyed. Um, think like during COVID, during the peak of COVID, all of your medical staff are tied up with treating COVID. Multiply that by, I don't know, a thousand times worse. Um, the medical staff are injured. They can't get to the area to effectively treat it. So even if they could, there's, there's not a whole lot they can do about it. This is a nasty dose, some nasty burns, shock waves that would have completely destroyed bodies, um, all kinds of broken arms uh, and legs injuries. It's, it's horrific. What you're seeing now are the images that I can safely show on this platform and in curating them. Okay. <laughs> Guess I jumped the gun. I figured he was, he should have, he would have brought this up. For all the destruction it caused, the little boy bomb was terribly inefficient. Of the bomb's 64 kilograms of uranium, less than one kilogram underwent fission. This figure made what happened even more terrifying. All right, here's why that was the case. So here's the little boy weapon. Little boy, it's this gun-shaped charge thing that only works in two dimensions. A conventional explosive moves the two masses of uranium-235 together so they would form a critical mass and get it to fission properly, which is where the destructive force of the bomb takes place after, after the nuclear reaction. Here, you're just dealing with basically a plane of contact between this, between the shape of this charge and the actual target. So a lot of space is wasted because you have very little time to set off this nuclear reaction. Nuclear reactions are extremely fast. There's a unit of measure for this called the shake. A shake is 10 nanoseconds or one times 10 to the minus eight power seconds. Extremely fast. So the geometry can throw that off. Let's compare that to the Fat Man device where they use a sphere. So you have 360 degrees in three dimensions to have this, to have this critical mass form. And it was an implosion device rather than an explosion. So less, less of a chance for tolerance errors to occur. The end result, this fat man bomb was about 10 times more efficient than the little boy bomb. Today's nuclear weapons are thousands of times more powerful. They can be, but the average ones, I would say, are on the order of tens to hundreds of times more powerful. There are big monsters like the Sar Bomber, but that was a large, impractical propaganda weapon that's on the order of thousands of times more powerful. but. Average ones were dealing in probably the 400 to 800 kiloton range compared to Hiroshima being 16 and um, Nagasaki being in the low 20s. Don't remember it off the top of my head, but just to give you a general sense. There are four ways to offensively detonate a nuclear bomb. What distinguishes them is altitude. Above 100,000 feet, a nuclear detonation is considered a high altitude burst, which produces a much larger fireball and more electromagnetic effects owing to the lack of a dense atmosphere. Below 100,000 feet. That one's one where that you want to detonate if you want to cause widespread electronic damage, um, so EMP. You can see why they didn't want to do this during World War II. One, they, their aircraft couldn't fly that high. And two, 
they don't have the vulnerable electronic systems that we do now. We would be much more susceptible to this type of attack now than they were back in the 1940s. Is an airburst, where thermal energy and blast makes it to the ground. A surface burst fireball touches the Airburst is probably the most common one. It's a good balance of energy um, and maximizes the amount of surface damage by having the blast explode outward and cause as much damage to the surface of the planet, which is where the, the buildings are, the infrastructure, wh what you would want to destroy in a nuclear attack. ...the ground, and a subsurface burst explodes underground or underwater. Surface bursts and subsurface bursts they can contaminate so much of the ground. One test that happened in 1946 was during in a detonation on the Bikini Atoll, um, Operation Crossroads, where they blew up a cluster of ships to see what effect they would a bomb would have on ships. This was submerged 90 feet underwater, and the result was devastating. For one, the pressure wave underwater is so much worse because of that hydraulic force. That shock wave is nasty. It destroyed so many more ships. And two was the contamination. So ships that were further away from the epicenter were damaged, but not outright destroyed. And the testers thought they, that, hey, we could salvage these for parts. But... There was so much contamination, and since it was underwater, it contaminated so much of the water and parts of the ship, they were unable to salvage a lot of these vessels because they were so heavily contaminated that the deconners couldn't even get close enough to do it effectively because the, do the dose rates were so high. So this particular test, you could argue, was the first real nuclear disaster in the terms of having unintended consequences of anything nuclear. This happened in 1946. Crucially, however, the fireball did not touch the ground. It was an airburst, so there was not a vast amount of dirt and vaporized debris for radioactive particles and fission products to attach to and fall out of the sky. It's true. Contamination was largely uh, limited as a result of this. The radiation damage done to Hiroshima's residents occurred over around 60 seconds and the majority of the residual radiation from the bomb was emitted in 24 hours. It follows from the physics, then, that Hiroshima and Nagasaki, another airburst, would experience few, if any, long-term health effects from nuclear fallout, despite anecdotal evidence to the contrary. And indeed, this is what the majority of studies and summaries of studies point towards. And Hiroshima today has a population well over a million people is even larger than it was back then. Back then it was 300k, something like that. A habitable Hiroshima is contrasted with a place like Pripyat. Here, in 1986, a nuclear reactor exploded and then burned for days, which dispersed actual pieces of nuclear fuel and longer-lived fission products across a large area. There was no- The uh, fallout from Chernobyl was about 30 to 100 times more than Hiroshima, though this is, we're talking about over a much longer period of time. So I would compare Hiroshima to a tidal wave, and here you have a th one of those thunderstorms that sits over your city for weeks, and turns out that actually drops more water. No nuclear detonation. Chernobyl was effectively a dirty bomb, not a nuclear one. As a result, Pripyat will remain abandoned for decades, though spending time there isn't as dangerous as you might think. Some people still live there, and will still live there. Today, stand in Hiroshima at ground zero with a Geiger counter, and you won't record anything above normal background radiation. Those of you who don't know, a Geiger counter is a very simple um, radiation uh, detector. doesn't really tell you what type of radiation is, it's more of just here be radiation kind of thing. Simple, lightweight, easy to use, commonly used in uh, nuclear power plants, radiological controlled areas for after you enter a contaminated area and you just want to rub a small one on your shoes, your legs, that just to make sure you're not taking any contamination out there with you and 
health physics um, or the radiation protection experts at the site regularly do do surveys using these types of detectors. The city is a living, breathing monument to both why we need to get rid of our nuclear weapons and in the face of nuclear weapons, how the human spirit can endure and survive. This is somewhat of a controversial thing. How do you guys feel about getting rid of nuclear weapons in their entirety? A lot of countries uh, see them as a way of defending against, naturally, other countries with, uh, with nuclear weapons. But you get into this, all right, let's get rid of nuclear weapons. And everyone goes, you first. <laughs> so that's a bit of a thing. Um, another thing I wanted to point out, mention, he mentioned abandoned for um, both... Pripyat, uh, Fukushima, don't think of it as it meaning like un they're uninhabitable. They have exclusion zones. Fukushima is tiny, at least compared to the Chernobyl exclusion zone in Ukraine. You're not going to get cancer. And you're certainly not going to get a lethal dose just by wandering in there. It just means the access is restricted to um, only personnel that have been cleared to go in. It is carefully mocked monitored think of it as a giant radiological controlled area that they just don't want people wandering in there unmonitored there's there's a radiological controlled area at a nuclear power plant i've been in many 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 times didn't get any dose at all but you are monitored by radiation protection health physics specialists to monitor your dose rate just to make sure it is controlled and hey if you like this video please join me on my journey to a clean nuclear energy future by liking subscribing and commenting thank you very much for watching i'll see you next time